Thus, if I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering in the Kusalan country with a large Sangha of monks. Eventually, he arrived at Kosala, at a Kosalan Brahmin village named Opasada. There the Blessed One stayed in the God's Grove, the Sala Tree Grove to the north of Opasada. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Chanki was ruling over Opasada, a crown property abounding in living beings, rich in grassland, woodlands, waterways, and green. A royal endowment a sacred grant given to him by King Pasanadi of Kosala. <clears throat> the Brahmin householder of Oposada heard the recluse Gotama The son of the Sakians went forth from the Sakian clan, has been wandering in the country of the, of the uh, Kosalans with a large Sangha of monks. Now a good report of Master Gotama has been spread to this effect. The Blessed One is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its brahmas and its maras, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, with its princes and its people which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end with the right phrasing and meaning. He reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. <clears throat> Now it is good to see such arahats. Then the Brahmin householders of Opasada set forth from Opasada in groups and bands and headed northwards to God's Grove, the Sala Tree Grove. Now on that occasion, the Brahmin Chanki had retired to the upper story of his palace for his midday rest. Then he saw the Brahmin householders of Opasada setting forth from Opasada in groups and bands and heading northward to the God's Grove, the Sala Tree Grove. When he saw them, he asked his minister, good minister, why are the Brahmin householders of Opasada setting forth from Opasada in groups and bands and heading northwards to the God's Grove, the Sala Tree Grove? <clears throat> Sir, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakians, who went forth from the Sakian clan, who has been wandering in the Kosalan country. They're going to see Master Gotama. Then, good minister, go to the Brahmin householders of Opasada and tell them, Sirs, the Brahmin Chanki says this, Please wait, sirs. The Brahman Chanki will also go to see the recluse Gotama. Yes, sir, the minister replied, and he went to the Brahman householders and gave them the message. Now, on that occasion, 500 Brahmins from various states were staying in Opasara for some business or other. They heard the Brahmin Chanki, it is said, is going to see the recluse Gotama. Then they went to the Brahmin Chanki and asked him, Sir, is it true that you're going to see the recluse Gotama? 
So it is, sirs, I'm going to see the recluse Gotama. Sirs, sir, do not go to see the recluse Gotama. It is not proper, Master Chanki, for you to go see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come to see you. For you, sir, are well born on both sides with pure maternal and paternal descent seven generations back, unassailable and impeccable in respect of birth. Since that is so, Master Chanki, it is not proper for you to go see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come see you. You, sir, are rich with great wealth and great possessions. You, sir, are a master of the three Vedas with the vocabularies, liturgy, phonology, and etymology, and the histories as the fifth. Skilled in philology and grammar, you are fully versed in the natural philosophy and the marks of a great man. You, sir, are handsome, comely, and graceful, possessing supreme beauty of complexion, with sublime, sublime beauty and sublime presence, remarkable to behold. You, sir, are virtuous, mature in virtue, possessing mature virtue, you, sir, are a good speaker with a good delivery. You speak words that are courteous, distinct, flawless, and communicate the meaning. You, sir, teach the teachers of many, and you teach the recitation of the hymns to the 300 Brahmin students. You, sir, are honored, respected, revered, venerated, and esteemed by King Pasanati of Kosala. Of Kosala. You, sir, are honored, respected, revered, venerated, and esteemed by the Brahmin Pokorasati. You, sir, rule over po Posanata, a crown property abounding with living beings a sacred grant given to you by King Pasanati of Kosala. Since this is so, Master Chanki, it is not proper for you to see the recluse Gotama. Rather, it is proper for the recluse Gotama to come see you. When this was said, the Brahmin Chanki told those Brahmins, now, sirs, hear why it is proper for me to go see Master Gotama and why it is not proper for Master Gotama to come see me. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is well born on both sides of pure maternal and paternal descent, seven generations back, unassailable and impeccable in respect to birth. He was not born a Brahmin. He was born in the warrior class. And the warrior class, they were the ones that were mostly the rulers. The Brahmins were more on the spiritual side, but they did rule some. But the warrior class was the, the class that fought the battles and that sort of thing. Since this is so, sir, it is not proper for Master Gotama to come see me. Rather, it is proper for me to see Master Gotama. Most people in the warrior class and the Brahmins could read. All the other lower classes, the merchants, the, the, uh, the skilled workers, that sort of thing couldn't. They gave the, their talks in Sanskrit, which only the Brahmins and the warrior class could understand. Then they had to translate it for the common people. 
this is why the Buddha didn't speak in Sanskrit. He spoke in the com common language. It's not Pali, actually. It's called Magadhan. That's where he stayed most of the time, was in the <coughs> country of the Magadhan. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth, abandoning much gold and bullion, stored away in vaults and lo in lofts. Sir, the recluse Gotama went forth from the home life into homelessness. <coughs> While still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessings of youth. The tradition with the Brahmins was as a young man they would get married, have a family, then they got to be about 60 years old they gave everything they owned to the family. <coughs> and of course, this is not all of them, but if they were prone towards ascetic practices and spiritual practices, when they were 60, they gave everything away and took on the robes. So to hear that somebody was a black haired young man is real unusual. Sirs, the recluse Gotama shaved off his hair and beard and put on the yellow robe and went, for, went forth from the home life into homelessness. Though his mother and father wished otherwise and wept with tearful faces. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is handsome, comely and graceful possessing supreme beauty of complexion with sublime beauty and sublime presence. Remarkable to behold. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is virtuous with noble virtue, with wholesome virtue, possessing whole, uh, wholesome virtue. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is a good speaker with good delivery. He speaks words that are courteous, distinct, flawless, and communicate the meaning. Sir, the recluse Gotama is a teacher of the teachers of many. Sirs, the recluse Gotama is free from sensual lust and without personal vanity. Sirs, the recluse Gotama holds the doctrine of moral efficacy of action. The doctrine of moral efficacy of deeds. He does not seek any harm for the line of the Brahmins. Brahmins were kind of afraid of him. In another sutta, they talk about his converting magic, which was giving them the Dhamma. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth from an aristocratic family, from one of the original noble families. His father was a king of an area. Sirs, the recluse Gotama went forth from a rich family, from a family of great wealth and great possessions. Sirs, People come from remote kingdoms and remote districts to question the recluse Gotama. Sirs, many thousands of deities have gone forth for refuge for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, a good report of the recluse Gotama has been spread to this effect. The Blessed One is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect and true knowledge and conduct, sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. Sirs, the recluse Gotama possesses the 32 marks of a great man. Sirs, the king Bimbasara of Magadha 
and his wife and his children have gone forth for refuge, for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, the King Pasanadi <clears throat> of Kosala and his wife and children have gone forth for refuge, for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, the Brahman Poko Horasati, his wife and children have gone forth for refuge, for life to the recluse Gotama. Sirs, the recluse Gotama has arrived at Opasada and is living at Opasada in God's grove, the Sala tree grove to the north of Opasada. Now any recluse or Brahmin that come to our town are our guests and guests should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated by us. Since the recluse Gotama has arrived at Opasada, he is our guest, and as our guest should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated by us. Since this is so, it is not proper for Master Gotama to come see me. Rather, it is proper for me to go see Master Gotama. Sirs, this much is the praise of Master Gotama that I have learned. But the praise of Master Gotama is not limited to that. For the praise of Master Gotama is immeasurable. Since Master Gotama possesses each of these factors, it is not proper for me to come it is not proper for him to come see me. Rather, it is proper for me to go see Master Gotama. Therefore, sirs, let all of us go to see the recluse Gotama. In India, the, because of the caste system, they really had a hierarchy. And the Brahmins were at the top of the of the list. So many people would go see the Brahmins rather than have Brahmins come and see him. And it was pretty strict. That's why this whole thing took place. Then the Brahmin Chaki, together with a large company of Brahmins, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. Now on that occasion, the Blessed One was seated, finishing some amiable talk with some rather senior Brahmins. At the time, sitting in the assembly was a Brahmin student named, we'll just call him the Brahmin student. Young, shaven head, 16 years old. He was a master of the three Vedas. That means he memorized all of the Vedas. That is no small task. And at 16 is pretty remarkable. With the vocabularies, liturgy, phonology, etymology, and histories as the fifth, skilled in philology and grammar, he was fully versed in the natural philosophy and marks of the great man. While the very senior Brahmins were conversing with the Blessed One, he repeatedly broke in and interrupted their talk. This is a definite no-no. He's too young to be doing that. Even the Buddhist monks, the senior monk talks to whoever they're visiting. Nobody else says anything. I, I was put in that position of being the senior monk of the, the Western monks. So when we would travel, I was the one that would talk to the abbot and ask him questions and that sort of thing. If they had a question, they had to write it down so and, and hand it to me. Don't speak.
Then the Blessed One rebuked the Brahmin student. Let not the venerable student break in and interrupt the talk of the very senior Brahmins while they are conversing. Now there, there's a problem with this kind of etiquette because if me being a junior monk would write something down I might get my question asked or not or I might get uh, ask them to clarify but I had to write it down and give it to the and sometimes they would answer and sometimes they wouldn't and not being able to discuss is a problem not only for the teacher why do I ask you for questions at the end of every talk I want questions so we can discuss but everybody sits here like a lump on the log without any questions Because of the Chinese and the way that they teach, they had great influence in all the countries of Asia. And they are taught not to question the teacher. And the teacher teaches them about 75% of what they need to know. So you can't ask questions about the other 25%. You will be disciplined if you do. And that makes the teacher, that puts him on a pedestal up higher. I don't like pedestals. It hurts when you fall off. So I try to get people to engage. We can talk about anything after the Dhamma talk. It doesn't have to be just on the talk. Let the venerable student wait until the talk is finished. So the Buddha was following that etiquette. If there's something you don't understand while I'm giving a Dhamma talk, raise your hand and ask the question, please. I will try to make it more clear if I can. I don't know all the answers. If I don't know, I will say I don't know, but I'll try to find out. When this was said, the Brahmin Chanki said to the Blessed One, let not Master Gotama rebuke the Brahmin student. The Brahmin student is a clansman. He is very learned. He has good delivery. He is wise. He is capable of taking part in the discussion with Master Gotama. When the then the Blessed One thought, surely, since the Brahmins honor him thus, the Brahmin student must be accomplished in, this, in the scriptures of the three Vedas. Then the Brahmin student thought, when the recluse Gotama catches my eye, I shall ask him a question. Then knowing with his own mind the thought of the Brahmin student, the Blessed One turned his eye towards him. Then the Brahmin student thought, the recluse Gotama has turned his eye towards me. Suppose I ask him a question. Then he said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, in regard to the ancient Brahmanic hymns that have come down through oral tradition, preserved in the collections, the Brahmins come to the definite conclusion, only this is true and anything else is wrong. What does the Master Gotama say about this? How then, student, among the Brahmins, is there even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong.
no master Gautama. So what are we talking about? You have to believe. No, not with the Buddha. You have to see. See for yourself. Don't believe. How then, student, among the Brahmins, is there even a single teacher or a teacher of teachers back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true. Anything else is wrong. No, Master Gotama. <clears throat> How then, student, the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, whose ancient hymns were formally chanted, uttered, and compiled, the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat, repeating what was spoken and reciting what was recited. Did even these ancient Brahmin seers say thus, we know this, we see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong? No, Master Gotama. So, student, it seems that among the Brahmins, there's not even a single Brahmin who says, I know this, I see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. And among the Brahmins, that there is not even a single teacher or a single teacher's teacher back to the seventh generation of teachers who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. And the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, even these ancient Brahmin seers did not say thus, we know this, we see this, only this is true and anything else is wrong. Suppose there were a file of blind men, each in touch with the next. The first does not see, the middle does not see, and the last one does not see. So too, student, in regard to their statement, the Brahmins seem to be like a file of blind men. The first one doesn't know, the middle one doesn't know, and the last one doesn't know or see. What do you think, student? That being so, does not the faith of the Brahmins turn out to be groundless? That's what blind belief is all about. And it, it runs rampant in the world that kind of blind belief. The Brahmins honored not only out of faith, Master Gotama, but they also honor it as an oral tradition. Student, first you take the stand on faith, and now you speak of oral tradition. There are five things, student, that may turn out in two different ways here and now. What five? Faith, approval, oral tradition, reason, cogitation, and reflective acceptance of a view. These five things may turn out in two different ways here and now. Now something may be fully accepted out of faith, yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But some, something else may not be fully accepted out of faith, yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. <clears throat> Again, something may be fully approved of, 
or well transmitted, well cogitated, well reflected upon. Yet it may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be well reflected upon, may not be factual, true, and unmistaken. Yet it may be, if, if it's not a, a widely accepted, it might be true and unmistaken. Under these conditions, it is not proper for a wise man who preserves the truth to the definite conclusion, only this is true and anything else is wrong. But Master Gotama, in what way is there the preservation of truth? How does one preserve truth? We ask Master Gotama about the preservation of truth. Good question. If a person has faith student, he preserves the truth when he says, my faith says thus. But he does not yet come to the definite conclusion, only this is true and anything else is wrong. In this way, student, there is the preservation of truth. In this way, he preserves the truth. In this way, we describe the preservation of truth. But as yet, there is no discovery of truth. If a person approves of something, if he receives an oral tradition, if he reaches a conclusion based on reason cogitation, if he gains reflective acceptance of a view, he preserves the truth when he says, um, my oral tradition or reason cogitation or reflective acceptance of a view is thus but he does not yet come to the definite conclusion only this is true and anything else is wrong. In this way too, student, there is the preservation of truth. In this way he preserves the truth. In this way we describe the preservation of truth, but as yet there is no discovery of the truth. You see how the Buddha is leading him on. <coughs> I used to give Dhamma talks about every other week to a bunch of professors at university. They were so impressed with this sutta, they started taking notes. Well, that, that not only is talking about spiritual path, that's the best way to teach other people. So listen closely. This, this is very good stuff. In that way, Master Gotama, there is the preservation of truth. In that way, one preserves the truth. In that way, we recognize the preservation of truth. But in what way, Master Gotama, is there the discovery of the truth? Ah, good question. In what way does one discover the truth? We ask Master Gotama about the discovery of truth. Here, student, a person may be living in dependence on some village or town. Then a householder or householder's son goes to him and investigates him in regard to three kinds of states. In regard to states based on greed, in regard to states based on hate, in regard to states based on delusion. Are there any in this venerable one 
Are there in this venerable one any states based on greed such that with his mind obsessed by these states, while not knowing he might say, I know, or while not seeing he might say, I see, or he might urge others to act in a way that would lead to their harm and suffering for a long time. As he investigates him, he comes to know there is no such states based on greed in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by greed. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound hard to see and hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle to be experienced by the wise. Again, here's that word wisdom, and that's talking about seeing how dependent origination actually works, and we'll be getting into that more starting tomorrow. This Dhamma can, cannot be easily taught by one affected by greed. When he has investigated him and he has seen that he is purified from states based on greed, he next investigates him in regard to states based on hate. Are there in this venerable one any states based on hate? such that with his mind obsessed by these states, he might urge others to act in a way that would lead him to harm and suffering for a long time. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such base states based on hate in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those of one affected by hate. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound to be experienced by the wise. This Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by hate. When he's investigated him and he has seen that he is purified from these states based on hate, he next investigates him in regards to states based on delusion. Are there in this venerable one any states based on delusion? What is delusion? Say it again, I didn't hear. Taking it personally. You, sir, have been watching my videos. <laughs> Good for you. Okay, any such states based on the losing, such that with his mind obsessed with these states, he might urge others in a way or to act in a way that would lead to harm and suffering for a long time. As he investigates him, he comes to know there are no such states based on delusion in this venerable one. The bodily behavior and verbal behavior of this venerable one are not those affected by delusion. And the Dhamma that this venerable one teaches is profound to be experienced by the wise. This is this Dhamma cannot easily be taught by one affected by delusion. Now, greed, hatred, delusion. These are a broken up way of saying craving. I like it, I don't like it, I am that. So he's saying, look for a teacher that has as little craving as possible. 
when he has investigated him and has seen that he is purified from states based on delusion, then he places faith in him. Filled with faith, he visits him, pays respect to him. Having paid respect to him, he gives ear. Listen closely. When he gives ear, he hears the Dhamma. I, I would prefer that hears and understands more of the Dhamma. Having heard the Dhamma, he memorizes it. The things <clears throat> that you start memorizing here are the six R's, the different kind of hatreds there are, the different kind of hindrances. <clears throat> and examines the meaning of the teaching he has memorized. So you don't just blindly say these things in the morning. They are there as a reminder so that you won't break a precept. When he examines their meaning, he gains reflective acceptance of those teachings. When he's gained reflective acceptance of those teachings, enthusiasm springs up. When enthusiasm has sprung up, he applies his mindfulness. Having applied his mindfulness, he scrutinizes. Having scrutinized, he strives. Strives here means using the six R's. Resolutely striving, he realizes with the body the supreme truth and sees it by penetrating it with wisdom. Now, you've seen me talk about the meninges, okay? That, it, it wraps around your entire uh, nervous system. And when the, there's a thought or feeling or sensation that arises, that the nerves spread out a little bit and that causes tension and tightness. <coughs> <coughs> this is how you recognize craving when it arises. Tension and tightness. Mostly you'll see it in your head. That's the biggest part. But when you relax here, you're relaxing your body. And it's the key to the six R's. Is it every thought, every feeling? Every, every unwholesome, unwholesome thought, feeling. It's not, doesn't arise with joy unless you hold on to it. But I'm talking just in general terms right now. In this way, student, there is the discovery of truth. In this way, one discovers truth. In this way, we describe the discovery of truth. But as yet, there's no final arrival at truth. In that way, Master Gotama, there is the discovery of truth. In that way, one discovers truth. In that way, we recognize the discovery of truth. But in what way, Master Gotama, is there the final arrival at truth? In what way does what finally arrive at truth? We ask Master Gotama about the final arrival at, at truth. The final arrival at truth, student, lies in the repetition, development, and cultivation of these same things. Practicing the six R's. They will take you to Nibbana. 
the relaxed step, being able to recognize the tension that happens in your head, in your mind, needs to be, let it be, relax. Then bring up something wholesome. Smile. What does smiling do? It helps your observation be light. <clears throat> you can have some low levels of joy arise. Just a happy feeling. And you bring that light, pure mind back to your object of meditation. And then stay with your object of meditation with that smile. It's pretty simple. This is not complicated at all. I have practiced many different kinds of meditation. Some of it is so complicated. I just, no, I, I can't do this. I talked with a Korean uh, abbot of a big temple. And he was trying to convince me of doing a meditation that was extremely complicated. I couldn't keep it all in my mind, what I was supposed to be doing. He said, well, I've been doing this for 35 years. It's pretty easy to do. Well, yeah, but if it takes me a year to learn it, that's not what we call immediately effective. Akaliko in Pali. See, the six R's are immediately effective. The first time you use it, it is effective. You recognize that your mind is distracted away from your object of meditation. You release the distraction. You don't keep your attention on it. If you keep your attention on the distraction, that's going to get bigger and harder to let go of. Now, there are some people that say, just follow that. This is choiceless awareness. Ask them what kind of development they, they've had with their, however long they've been practicing meditation. Are you successful? Do you know what it is to be successful in the meditation? Most people don't. They need to be educated that there is a very systematic way of doing this. As soon as you allow and take your attention away from that distraction, and put your attention on relaxing, that's immediately effective. Immediate. You've gone from having an unwholesome mind to a wholesome mind in a fraction of a second. Then you bring up something wholesome, you smile. Bring that back to your object of meditation. That is immediately effective. When I went to Burma the first time, I stayed at Mahasi Center. I was there for eight months. And they had all of Mahasi Sayadaw's books, of which there was 30 or 35 books. So I got all the books and I started reading them. He had a book on dependent origination. And the introduction said, this is very difficult to understand. I read it. He explained it in a way that is very difficult to understand. He was right. In the Visuddhi Magga, it talks about dependent origination and they said, it's like putting the weight of all the oceans on your head. 
that's hard to understand. Well, the way they explain it, it is. But it is easy to understand and you will understand at least the beginning parts of this before this retreat is over. Okay? Promise. Anyway, the repetition, the using the six R's over and over again, purifying your mind of the craving, immediately effective, very simple. When the Buddha was teaching the farmers, he had to have a system that was easy to understand. He had to have a system that worked quickly because they would lose their interest. But he found this. The six R's are part of the Eightfold Path. In, in my book, I call it harmonious practice. It's right effort. Okay. First part of right effort. In, in, in the sutta, there's, there's four parts to it. I added a couple extra steps so it's easier to understand, but it's still the same thing. You recognize when an unwholesome state arises by seeing that tension and tightness. You release the unwholesome state and relax. You bring up something wholesome. Smile. Bring that smiling mind back to your object of meditation. That is wholesome too and continue staying with your object of meditation for as long as you can. Repeat. So the four great efforts in the six R's are the same thing. Now this, the I have been criticized by telling people I want you to smile. The Buddha never taught that. He didn't teach anybody to smile. No, he said we're the happy ones. What's the expression of being happy? Smile. I want you to smile all the time. I don't care what kind of meditation you're doing, smile. Why? <clears throat> it improves your mindfulness. Again, mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. That's actually a very deep definition because you don't get caught in following things. Now, when I was taught at Mahasi Center and before I'd been practicing, I was taught that when painful feeling arises, Put your attention right in the middle of that painful feeling. Quote, see its true nature. Its true nature hurt. It was painful and it made the pain bigger and more intense because I was feeding it with my attention. So that, re that release step not keeping your attention on the distraction is very important. You have to follow it up with the relaxed step or else you're not going to purify your mind. How do you purify your mind? You let go of craving. 
right after you relax that tightness, you see your mind doesn't have any thinking in it. Your mind is observing. It's clear. It's bright. Your awareness is very agile. It sees very quickly what's happening. And it is pure. It's not, it's, it's, it's wholesome now. Then you bring that to your smile and come back to your object to meditation. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the only practice that I've ever run across that is so immediately effective. And you have to repeat it. Maybe a hundred thousand times, maybe a million, who knows? But you keep using the six R's, you will progress in the meditation. Don't add any other kind of meditation to what you're doing. I had a man that came here. I've been doing uh, Vedanta for 40 years. And he was throwing in all kinds of stuff. Oh, on the in-breath, I breathed in loving kindness. On the out-breath, I let go of craving said, who told you to do that? Who told you to mix up two different kinds of meditation at the same time? Or three, actually. He said, I didn't tell you to do that. If you don't follow the instructions, you're not going to learn. And it took him, how long was he here? He, must, he was here for almost a month. But he finally started following what I was talking about. To have somebody here for a month doing a retreat. After two weeks, I don't know what to do with you. Because you already know what you're doing by that time. That's the nature of following the suttas. Now, I've done a lot of one-month retreats. I've done a lot of three-month retreats. I did an eight-month retreat. I did a two-year retreat. All with the same kind of meditation. And that's kind of what Einstein said. You do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. That's crazy. And I was. But I went through that so, you don't have to. Ten-day retreat or two-week retreat is plenty long enough. You will understand when you don't add like this other guy did. Oh, but I know in, in, in yoga you got to do this and well, okay, do that, but don't do it here. You're not going to learn if you do it here. He was very difficult to teach. I like students that are easy to teach. I like beginners, because they don't have any clue what's going to be happening. And it works pretty good that way. And they can be even more successful than somebody that's done a retreat before. So repetition and development and cultivation of all of these different qualities. As you start going deeper in your meditation, you're going to start getting a little bit enthusiastic. You're going to start going, you know, this stuff works. Yeah, this is good. I had a student that was in Korea. She was considered 
really a special teacher. She'd been doing one-pointed concentration. I kept telling her, have fun with the meditation. Stop being so serious. She started following what I was saying. And she came to me one day with this look of wonder on her face. And she said, I am having fun. I didn't think that was possible. I had another student that had been teaching a different form of meditation for 20 years. And he came to me and he said, I honestly know what a pleasant abiding here and now means. This is fun. Don't get serious with it, please. Turn it into a game. Your mind's crazy anyway. Isn't that right? That's why he can laugh, because he knows how crazy mind is. <laughs> so laugh with it. Laugh at its shenanigans. With all of its different kinds of distractions. Don't take them seriously. Oh, but sadness is serious. No, it's not. Anger is serious. No, it's not. Actually, anger is one of the funniest things that you can have. <laughs> it's really true. If your perspective is according to the six R's. Laughter changes your perspective from I am that where your mind is really serious and you're taking it personally to, well, it's only that. We don't need to carry that around. Let it go. You go from the personal to the impersonal. That's immediately effective. Having fun with the meditation is really a necessary part of the practice. Now, I've, I've, as I said, I've done a lot of retreats. And <clears throat> with the kind of meditation that I've been doing before, I'd get up and start walking out and people were still sitting and I'd look at their faces and they're their faces are all screwed up and they're really trying hard. Now, is that what you call right effort? <laughs> and at the end of the retreat, and this, this went after every retreat that I took, we sat around and talked about how hard it was. <laughs> And people that come and practice with me, they start complaining. Oh, can't we just stay a few more days? This is fun. Go off and have fun. That's the way life is supposed to be. It's supposed to be fun. Anytime you see your mind getting serious, you're attached. So laugh with it. Mind is crazy. Laugh at the craziness. In this way, student, there is the final arrival at truth. In this way, one finally arrives at truth. In this way, we describe the final arrival at truth. In that way, Master Gotama, there is the final arrival at truth. In that one way, one finally arrives at truth. In that way, we recognize the final arrival at truth. But what, Master Gotama, is most helpful for the final arrival at truth? We asked Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for the final arrival at truth. 
One of the things that I, I don't say this on every retreat, but I say it often. When you were in school and you had a favorite class, how did you do? Why? Because it was fun. It was fun figuring out what needed to be figured out or doing what needed to be done. So you did well with it. This is the same thing. Striving is most helpful for the final arrival at truth, student. If one does not strive, one will not finally arrive at truth. But because one strives, one does finally arrive at truth. You have to try. Oops. <laughs> you have to do. You have to set your mind. This is not an easy practice sitting, especially at first. Sitting without moving. Your body comes up with all kinds of aches and pains. That's what you move around for. Because that, that restlessness comes up it's a painful feeling and you move so you don't have to look at it. Now you get to sit as still as you possibly can. Then you get to watch mind and how that reacts to it. And you get to use the six R's. After a short period of time it gets much easier. I've been in stores and I've been in museums where I'm looking at something very intently, not moving, because I've developed that habit not to move a whole lot. And I turn around and start to walk away and somebody right beside me jumps and they say, I thought you were a mannequin. <laughs> And that's a really a high compliment. <laughs> because I was, I was being intent on what I was looking at. When I, I got done with it, then I started moving away. I don't have a lot of restlessness. Why? Because of the years of practice and learning how to let it go. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for striving? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for striving. Scrutiny is most helpful for striving. You have to scrutinize and make sure that the six R's are the right thing to do. Don't believe it because I say it. Don't believe anything that I say. See for yourself. You are your own teachers. When a hindrance arises, it's not something to fight with. It's something to open up and allow it to be there. Six are it. But it's showing you where your attachments are. And as you purify your mind and go deeper, you're still going to have some hindrances arise. That's the nature of this process. But the hindrance is there to help you. It improves your mindfulness because you have to six R and, and come back and be with your object of meditation. Every time you do that, mind becomes more clear. More, more observant of how this process works. That's why the definition of mindfulness helps you go a lot deeper than uh, most definitions of mindfulness. A lot of people try to use the word mindfulness as a way of blocking and stopping things from coming up. 
it's not for that. A meditation pain can come up into your body. You 6R it, the pain doesn't go away necessarily. But your, your attachment to the pain starts going away. You might have to go back and keep doing it over and over again because it keeps pulling your attention to it. Fine. That is a hindrance. And it's there to teach you where you grabbed on because of past actions. What you do with what arises in the present dictates what happens in the future. If you fight with it, if you resist it, if you try to change it, if you try to make it different than it is, you can look forward to that hindrance coming up over and over again. Or you make a decision of whether you're going to 6R or not, or whether you're going to fight with it or not. The 6R is not necessary, it's not there to make it stop. It will do that on its own. The 6Rs are there to show you where your attachment is. And the 6Rs are there to help you let go of that attachment. As you do that, you start understanding this is a process that you're going through. You're not really trying to develop deep concentration. It comes by itself as you let go of the hindrances. It doesn't matter what jhana you're in. When your mindfulness becomes weak for whatever reason, distracted, that hindrance, another hindrance is going to come up. Treat it like an old friend. I read one thing of the, the Tibetans, they said, invite it in for tea. Do that. Don't fight with it. Don't try to change it. Don't try to make it any different than it is. It's only a hindrance and it's not even yours. You didn't ask it to come up. You can't make it go away. So there's no controller in there. It's teaching you part of the impersonal process. Every time you relax. If one does not scrutinize, see how it works, one will not strive. But because one scrutinizes, one strives. That's why scrutiny is most helpful for striving. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for scrutiny? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for scrutiny application of mindfulness is most helpful for scrutiny. Now, a hindrance comes up and it pulls you away from your object of meditation and you use the six R's and come back to your object of meditation. And then it pulls you away again. So you do the same thing again. As you become more and more familiar with how this process works, right before your mind got really caught up in the hindrance, you're going to see that there was something that happened right before then. So you use 6R and you come back, you get pulled back again, but you recognize that thing that happened right before that which is a link of dependent origination you're seeing. And you 6R right then. So the length of time that you're away from your object of meditation becomes shorter 
and the length of time that you stay with the object of meditation becomes longer. So, this application of mindfulness is very, very important. Observe how this process works. I don't care what kind of hindrance it is. I call all, dis all hindrances distractions. So whatever the distraction is, fine. It can be there. It's your teacher. Treat it with respect. Be grateful that it came up because it's helping you to observe more closely how this process works. If one does not apply one's mindfulness, one will not scrutinize. Because one applies mindfulness, one scrutinizes. That's why the application of mindfulness is most helpful for scrutiny. But what, Master Gotama, is most helpful for the application of mindfulness? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for the application of mindfulness. Enthusiasm is most helpful. Having a little bit of fun with it. If one does not arouse their enthusiasm, one will not apply their mindfulness. You have to take an interest in it. But because one arouses their enthusiasm, one applies their mindfulness. That's one of the reasons that I keep saying over and over, make it a game. This is a process. It's not your process, but become familiar with how it works. Smile, have some fun with it. And laugh at how crazy your mind can get. Because it's going to do that. It's going to get crazy. Okay, fine. I don't care. <laughs> That's why enthusiasm is most helpful for the application of mindfulness. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for enthusiasm? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for en enthusiasm. Reflective acceptance of the teaching is most helpful for enthusiasm when you start getting the insights, you start seeing for yourself how these things arise. You said that the meditation turns into an oh wow meditation. Oh wow, I didn't recognize that before. Now I see it clearly. So your enthusiasm becomes much better when you start reflecting on how this process works. All of this stuff is interconnected. It's woven together. One of the worst things about the commentary is they start tearing these threads apart. And they say, well, faith is over here in this bowl. And enthusiasm is over here. And your mindfulness is over here and they take it all apart, and you can't do that. It's all interwoven. You have to do it in a systematic way. Now, that's one of the reasons that I read the suttas so much, is because it's the most systematic, logical way to study. Is that a reference to harmonies and virtues? All of that is part of it. <clears throat> this is, right now, is more the nuts and bolts of it. But it's not separate from the parami. 
If one does not gain the reflective acceptance of the teaching, enthusiasm won't spring up. I know a lot of people that have been doing meditation for many, many years. They hit a wall. That's as far as they're going to go. Their enthusiasm in the meditation starts disappearing. I know people that have been practicing for 20 years, they just stop meditating altogether. It's not going anywhere. That does not happen with this kind of meditation. But because one gains a reflective acceptance of the teaching, enthusiasm springs up. That's why reflective acceptance of the teaching is most helpful for enthusiasm. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teaching? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for a reflective acceptance of the teachings. Examination of the meaning, see for yourself, is most helpful for the reflective acceptance of the teaching. So you see how these two are intertwined. You have to examine and see for yourself. Is what Bhante is saying right or not? Question. It's okay to question. Don't ask the same question over and over to me. I'll bark at you. But answer it for yourself. And if you can't figure it out, ask your intuition. That will help you. If one does not examine their meaning, one will not have gain a reflective acceptance of the teaching. But because one examines their meaning, one gains a reflective examination of the meaning. That's why it's most helpful for reflective exception, a reflective reflection. But what Master Gotama is most helpful for examination of the meaning? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for examination of meaning. Memorizing the teaching is most helpful for examining the uh, meaning. If one does not memorize a teaching, one will not examine its meaning. But because of memorize, memorize, one memorizes the teaching, one examines its meaning. I've been around some pretty fantastic monks, great monks, that have memorized all of the Tipitaka. I was, uh, in, when I went to Burma, the Mingun Sayada, who was the chief answerer at the Six Buddhist Council, he was written up in the uh, Guinness Book of Records for best retentive memory. He memorized 12,000 pages of material. Now, he not only memorized it, he took tests on it to make sure he hadn't make any, made any mistakes. You know how in college you go and you have, oh, I got a four hour test that I have to do and, and then you get done, you feel real drained. Well, he took every day a test 10 hours a day. And on each section, like this book here is called the Majjhima Nikaya, he could not make more than six mistakes or he failed. He wound up taking the test 30 days in a row. He got over 90% correct of everything that he memorized. What a fantastic memory this guy had. Any question you had about, 
What does it say about this sutta? He could say it right there. The sutta says this. And the commentary will say that. And then there's a sub-commentary that says this. He carried all of that around with him like he carried his skin. It was real fun hanging out with him. Unfortunately, I had to go through a translator who didn't understand near enough. So I never knew whether he got what I was talking about and I never knew with what I got back was what he said. But I did ask him some very interesting questions because Vipassana was the name of the game in Burma. I asked him about Kanaka Samadhi and Upachara Samadhi. Where does it talk about that in the suttas? He says it doesn't. That's a commentary. Okay, a commentary is my interpretation of what I think the Buddha was talking about. It might be right, it might be wrong. Who knows? The thing with the sub-commentary, it's written after the commentary, the Visuddhimagga is a commentary, and there is a sub-commentary, and there's more than one version of the sub-commentary where a lot of the mistakes that were in the Visuddhi Magga are brought to light. Yeah. The two samadhis you mentioned. What? You mentioned the two samadhis. Kanaka samadhi and Upachara samadhi come from the Visuddhi Magga. And it started up around the second century AD. That's when Dhammapala was, was alive and he was a very famous teacher in southern, southern India. And he's actually the one that was responsible for the Theravadins coming into being. In order to be a Theravada monk, you have to take some commentaries the same as the Buddha's teaching. And when I started going to some of my older friends that had been monks for 50 years or so saying, I can't do that. It doesn't agree with the suttas. I was told flat out, you, then you can't be a Theravada monk. And I went, oh man, I'm creating all these problems for myself. And then he came back and said, you're still a Buddhist monk. But now we are starting to <clears throat> call the kind of Buddhism that we're teaching Suttavada. Okay, it's sutta study. And we don't rely so much on commentaries, although if they agree with the suttas, we can use parts of the commentaries or sub-commentaries. Okay? But what Master Gotama is most helpful for memorizing the teaching? We asked Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for memorizing the teachings. Hearing the Dhamma is most helpful for memorizing the teachings. If one does not hear the Dhamma, one will not memorize the teachings. But because one hears the Dhamma, one memorizes the teachings. That's why hearing the Dhamma is most helpful for memorizing the teachings. 
some of the bigger teachers now are starting to recognize that the repetition in the suttas is a necessary thing. Almost everything is repeated three times. I mean, I, I just repeated hearing the Dhamma a bunch of times. Why? Because it sinks in. This is an oral tradition. Although you're hearing me read it, it's presented in such a way where you have the repetition in it. Some of it, I, some of the suttas that I'll give you, I'll put the repetition in. And it stays in your thinking. Your understanding is much better when you hear it. When you read it, it gets real boring to read the same thing three times in a row. But when you hear it, it goes to a different part of your brain. And that makes a difference. Now some of the, the bigger teachers are saying, uh, yeah, it's good to hear this repetition. I took this entire book and I took the ditto, ditto marks out of every one of the suttas. I put the repetition back in. So a sutta that's maybe five or six pages long, when I put the repetition in, it's more like 25 pages long. That's how much repetition actually is in this. <clears throat> but Master Gotama, but what Master Gotama is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for hearing the Dhamma. Giving ear, paying attention, not uh, being fidgety. Just listen. That's why he said, I don't want you doing the beads because that's a distraction. You're not hearing all the way. And I'm not being critical. You can do the beads anytime you want, just not here. <laughs> if one does not give ear, one will not hear the Dhamma deeply. But because one hear, gives ear, one hears the Dhamma very well. That's why giving ear is most helpful for hearing the Dhamma. But what, Master Gotama, is most helpful for giving ear? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for giving ear. Paying respect is most helpful for giving ear. If one does not pay respect, one will not give ear. But because one pays respect, one gives ear. That's why paying respect is most helpful for giving ear. Not thinking about something else. That's not being respectful. Being respectful means listening as closely as you can. Not judging or condemning. Just listen. You can compare that with the suttas later if you want. That's up to you. But what Master Gotama is helpful for paying, most helpful for paying respect? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for paying respect. Visiting is most helpful for paying respect. Coming to the center so you can hear it. If one does not visit a teacher, one will not pay respect to him. But because one visits a teacher, one pays respect to him. That is why visiting is most helpful for paying respect. <coughs> but what, Master Gotama, is the thing most helpful for visiting? We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for giving or for visiting. Now you're going to love this answer. 
faith is most helpful for visiting. If faith in a teacher does not arise, one will not visit him. But because faith in a teacher arises, you visit him. That's why faith is most helpful. So we just did a great big circle, coming back to faith. We asked Master Gotama about the preservation of truth, and Master Gotama answered about the preservation of truth. We approve of and accept that answer, so we're satisfied. We asked Master Gotama about the discovery of truth, and Master Gotama answered about the discovery of truth. We approve of and accept that answer. And so we are satisfied. That's hard for Brahmins to say because they have their own special way of doing things and saying things. We ask Master Gotama about the final arrival at truth and Master Gotama answered about the final arrival at truth. We approve of and accept that answer and so we're satisfied. We ask Master Gotama about the thing most helpful for final arrival at truth. And Master Gotama answered about the, most, the thing most helpful for the arrival at truth. We approve of and accept that answer and so we're satisfied. Whatever we ask Master Gotama about, that he has answered us. We approve of and accept that answer, and so we're satisfied. Formally, Master Gotama, we used to think, who are these ball-pated recluses, these swarthy menial offspring of the kinsmen's feet? Now, that's really a big insult, because they didn't wear any sandals or shoes at the first part of the Buddha's teaching, the Buddha finally allowed uh, sandals to be worn, and I'm forever grateful for that. But your feet are always dirty. That's why you hear me in the suttas, a Buddha sits down and washes his feet, because he's been tromping around in the dust without any uh, protection for his feet, so he had to wash it fairly often. Who were these menial offspring of the kinsmen feet that they would understand the Dhamma? But Master Gotama has inspired in me love for recluses, confidence in recluses, and reverence for recluses. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. So it's a real interesting thing that the professors at a college would listen to this Dhamma talk and come away with new ideas in how to get people to learn. So, are you ready for this?